2007 was a gigantic year on Nick.com. With Sarbakken releasing well-received Flash games on a regular basis, SpongeBob SquarePants was reaching a new height with its online presence. These were coming out much more frequently, and the quality was greatly improving. This was the era of Sarbakken, and one of the most noteworthy years in SpongeBob Flash game history. So fasten your sea belts, because we're about to dive into this blast from the past. Let's start with a big one. Many of you might remember a certain little game in particular called Dutchman's Dash. Because if you were like me, it probably made your child self cry. Let me play the music to unlock some deep-seated memories in a few of you. Now if you're looking for a challenge, look no further. This game will test the absolute limits of your strength, and maybe even your patience. In the story, the Flying Dutchman has stolen Gary, so you have to bring him back. You do this by running through a series of obstacle-laden stages that take a life away at the slightest touch. You play as Spongebob and Patrick as you dash through the stages and try to jump over obstacles and enemies. You can even smash the enemies. You move quickly, so you have to know when to slow down to avoid ramming into obstacles. If you get hit, you switch to the other character. It's tough, but Squidward's here to act as a checkpoint. Wow! This is something you have to play a lot to get the hang of. You have to learn where the obstacles are and how to prepare yourself for them. Even still, it's gonna be really tough. Thankfully, you can find this power-up that makes you blow up like a pufferfish to destroy enemies. It's extremely convenient. This jellyfish one also gives you a projectile. And if you collect a hundred little bubble buddies, you get an extra life, so don't neglect them. But the real challenge is the fact that the game is five levels long, and if you run out of lives, you have to start over again. Without challenging this whole thing is, that's a harsher punishment than it would normally be. I've never been able to get past level 4 myself, but if you manage, you have to fight the Flying Dutchman. Then you run backwards through every stage with Gary while the Flying Dutchman chases you in his ship. So they really make you work for that victory. You definitely deserve a medal if you're able to beat it. It's extremely difficult, but highly amusing. Still, it isn't the most challenging Spongebob Flash game out there. There are other ones that are, um... Even more... terrifying. But we're only in 2007, let's not get too far ahead. Now that was a Sarbakken game, but the other big company in the Spongebob Flash game scene was This Is Pop. Let's check out the games they made this year. This is Delivery Dilemma, which is a Spongebob version of Spy Hunter. You have to deliver ingredients to the Krusty Krab while managing the awful traffic conditions. Also Plankton's minions, who will try to ram you off the road. You can even throw pickles at other cars to literally destroy them. Are you sure those pickles are safe to be putting on Krabby Patties? Maybe Bubble Bass should have been more grateful. And I'd say it's strange for Spongebob to be driving, but it is a sandwich, and you don't need a license to drive one of those. This is really easy if you just move forward and win, but the fun comes from trying to knock the other cars off the road. You can even pick up power-ups by running into cars that have them. But like I said, this one's really easy. It has a lot of potential for fun you can have with it, though. People ask why I don't drive in real life, but then they see how I play games like this and suddenly it all makes sense. But another This Is Pop creation based on a classic arcade game was Patty Panic. This one's based on Burger Time, which has always been one of my favorite classics. It's also worth mentioning that you can often recognize a This Is Pop game with this character sprite they frequently use. They have a consistent style. But yeah, it's Burger Time. You walk across sandwich ingredients on platforms to knock them into respective boxes. You avoid enemies and attack them with mustard or other collectibles. Or you can drop the ingredients on them and make them part of the sandwich. The enemies are Plankton and his relatives, so I guess Mr. Krabs wasn't joking about that one secret ingredient. But yeah, this one's great. We also have Pyramid Peril, based on Qbert. The story in this one is kind of amusing. The Bikini Bottom Coral Hills are wilting, so you have to save them by changing them to a certain color. You click to make Spongebob jump on a pyramid and try to get all the tiles to be that color. You have to avoid enemies and jumping over the edge, which is easier said than done. Thankfully, you can crush your enemies. You can even jump on Gary to freeze time. Well, I wasn't expecting him to do that. There are also cool mechanics like these whirlpools that send you away from danger. They're good to incorporate into strategies. Again, this is a lot of fun and one you'll enjoy if you like Qbert. These games also remind me of one I used to play called Otto's Magic Blocks. 
I have so much undying nostalgia for those ancient wild tangent games. But the other This Is Pop arcade tribute to come out this year was Sea Monster Smush, based on Dig Dug. I really like the music in this one. So this game adds some lore to the Spongebob universe. Spongebob is the star agent of Bikini Bottom's special porous unit. He has to dig underground and hunt for sea monsters, and to steal their treasure. You dig underground with your special device and attack the monsters you see. Did... did he just do that? But actually, when you hit an enemy, you blow them up until they burst. Wow, brutal. But this is really fun. You can even mess around with obstacles like these anchors to shake up the way you kill. But let's get back to Sarbakken. This year saw the release of the Spongebob episode Friend or Foe. It was a highly advertised event that would tell the gut-wrenching backstory of Plankton and Mr. Krabs. It was really fascinating to see as a kid. It wasn't often that we had episodes really diving into character backstories. But they made a game out of it called Friend or Foe Trash Bash. You play as Plankton and Mr. Krabs as they try to retrieve the Krabby Patty secret recipe from the dump. The liquid trash beneath you is slowly rising, so you have to break through platforms with Mr. Krabs' claw to work your way up. You collect the different pieces of the recipe and try to coordinate your path so you don't end up cornering yourself. You can even throw Plankton and move him with the arrow keys, but it takes a good bit of time to move him where you want to go and back to Mr. Krabs. It isn't always worth doing. And I'll admit, it's been a long time since I've seen the episode, but I don't remember younger Plankton having the ability to fly. Maybe he's just swimming up. It is the ocean after all. But this game is really hard to stop playing. It's effective in its simplicity, and the obstacles can require some amount of thinking to get through. You have to work around these platforms that sink beneath you and try to collect out-of-the-way bonuses and recipe pieces without wasting too much time. Though it is amusing to watch yourself slam into the bottom of platforms, even the death animation is pretty funny. <laughs> Splat. Well, let's keep this ride moving. This next game is... um... Do I really have to say its name? Well, it's been a long time coming. It was only natural that we'd reach this point eventually. The time has come to talk about Plankton's Crusty Bottom. Weekly. I don't know if I could deal with that on a weekly basis. You're reporting for the new Crusty Bottom newspaper and need to photograph civilians when they're at their weirdest. You can even click to make stuff happen in certain scenes. Then you take a picture and get a certain amount of money based on how funny it is. You're judged on centering, timing, and goofiness with a 5-star rating system. Hey, why is Larry so tiny? Some of these scenarios can be pretty hilarious, but goofiness is a pretty subjective concept. So in my opinion, the rating isn't always accurate. But hey, no laughing at Plankton's crusty bottom. This really is just something you can play and fascinate yourself with for a little bit. It's cool, though I can understand people that think Plankton's crusty bottom stinks. But as for me, I'm open to experiencing Plankton's crusty bottom weekly. Okay, that was a lot. So let's take a break from Sarbakken. Let's see what else is going on this year. 2007 saw the release of two major sequels to popular Nick Arcade games, Diner Dash and Obstacle Odyssey. Ironically, they had very similar titles, Two Times the Trouble and Time Trouble. Same year, too. How's that for a coincidence? Diner Dash 2 was developed by Play First and Snap to Play, the same companies who made the first one. Snap to Play also made Obstacle Odyssey, so maybe that explains the similarities. Now, in typical Nick Arcade fashion, Diner Dash 2 was a reskin of the original Diner Dash 2 Restaurant Rescue, but it had its own story told through comic panels. This rich shark guy named Sharky Two Times comes to the Krusty Krab and offers to buy it and turn it into a casino. SpongeBob doesn't like this, so he dials his work ethic up to the max in the hopes that selling so many Krabby Patties would make selling the Krusty Krab meaningless. Then you're thrown back into the Diner Dash format to please as many customers as possible to move up in the world. It's a much more fleshed out version of the first game with more to see and do in each restaurant. Sharky goes to each location, each taken from the show, and tries to buy it. Only this time, the show's cast comes in to defend the location and send him away, so you get to play as more than one character. He even visits medieval moments from Dunces and Dragons. Like with the first game, this one is extremely stressful and not for the easily overwhelmed, but good for people who like restaurant simulators and the usual Diner Dash games. Now, Obstacle Odyssey 2 had a similar idea with comics telling the story, as well as new characters such as Mr. Krabs, Sandy, and Patrick, who now became playable after you unlock them. Each of them have their own special abilities, too. The plot involves Plankton inventing a time machine to send Spongebob and his friends back in time so they can't stop him from stealing the Krabby Patty secret recipe. 
Grabbing a time machine remote before jumping in, SpongeBob is able to control which time period he goes to so he can find each of his friends. He travels through this massive map of stages with designs inspired by different time periods. It's cool to see so much variety in all the new features. One of the most convenient changes from the first one is this bubble that brings you back whenever you fall over the edge sometimes. Really wish the first game had that in some of its harder stages. I still have nightmares about that slide. The new character powers are also cool to have, but Sandy's just a little too overpowered with her double jump. Once you get her, most of the stages become so much easier, probably more so than Snap to Play ever wanted them to be. That being said, I will say that a lot of the stage designs are kinda... eh. There are an awful lot of them, and sometimes it feels like quantity was a higher priority for the developers. Many of them are reused from the first game, or they only really involve you walking straight to the end with little to no conflict. Still, there's a lot of joy to be had with this. The animation is also slightly cleaner than it was in the original, and the game has more life to it. I'd say it's worth giving it a try. But since we're on the topic of 3D games, let's get back to another Sarbacan one. This is 3D Power Kart Grand Prix. Now as you can see, this has a significantly different style than most games you'd find on Nick.com. This is a racing game, and back at the time when it came out, you could build your own tracks and race on ones that were submitted. Sadly, you can't anymore, but it was once a great feature. Basically, Spongebob and his friends are racing. Wait a minute, that's not a sandwich. Who the heck is letting Spongebob drive? So you choose between Spongebob, Patrick, Mr. Krabs, and Sandy, as well as one of four cars. I'll also admit the models have pretty strange expressions, but you don't see them for most of the game anyway. Spongebob looks like he's harboring a deep secret, Sandy looks like she's faking a smile in an unideal situation, and Mr. Krabs and Patrick just look... strange. But anyway, the cars have their own strengths and weaknesses. Between speed, acceleration, power-up slots, and handling, they're rated on a scale of 1 to 5 stars. Then when you start, you race through a very green bikini bottom as hell is being unleashed through the skies. You can collect power-ups and toggle through them to either help yourself or hurt someone else. Sadly, I had some pretty bad luck with the bathtub. I guess bathing while trying to race is a bad idea. But anyway, this is a pretty basic racing challenge. Essentially what you can expect from a short Spongebob racing game. A similar one made by Sarbacan was Snow Cart Rally, which was a Nicktoons crossover game rather than just being a Spongebob game. Aside from Spongebob, we have Tack from Tack and the Power of Juju, Jimmy from Jimmy Neutron, and Otis from Back at the Barnyard. It's a similar game, but all winter-themed instead, though it's hard to drive for very long without being frozen. It's like trying to drive during a Chicago winter. Sarbacan also released Super Stuffed Nicktoons minigame Mania this year. It was very similar to Badger Hammer's Where's Gary from a few years prior. It was a fast-paced series of minigames featuring all the same shows as Snowcart Rally, but also including Danny Phantom, Avatar, and El Tigre. It can be hard to fully comprehend what you have to do in the short time you're given for each mission, but it's really nice. But sticking with Spongebob, Sarbacan also released Jellyfish Shuffleboard. And this was a few years before the episode shuffleboarding. So let's see what this is about. Love the semi-3D look Spongebob has going on here. You can choose to either go for a high score or play versus mode. Then you choose to be either Spongebob or Sandy. Yee-haw! Eh? Come again, Sandy? Yee-haw! What was that voice? Basically, it's shuffleboard. You drag the mouse back and try to hit your jellyfish into the opponent's zone, earning a certain amount of points depending on where it lands. You can even run over some bonuses and knock your previous jellyfish to different sections. It's really good for what it is, but it's highly prone to glitches. Like this one. <laughs> As you can see, you should never play shuffleboard with Spongebob. He's way too fast for anyone to even keep up with. But let's see if that speed will help him in this one where he's being chased by an avalanche. This is Avalanche at Plankton's Peak. I guess it's better than an avalanche coming from Plankton's Krusty Bottom. We only have high class humor on this channel. Now I do have to admit, this game is really hard, but also kind of impressive. It actually has a cutscene in the beginning. Not a lot of Nickelodeon Flash games had those. Plankton uses a machine to cause an avalanche, so the Bikini Bottomites are about to have their skiing adventure ruined. Now Spongebob has to save everyone. The instructions tell you that you can press N for something to happen, but rather than telling you what it is, they just say, Now that would be telling, wouldn't it? Oh come on, don't make me curious. This better be worth a- Ah, you gave me a Rudolph nose. Also antlers. So you ski down this mountain filled with obstacles and try to collect the other skiers. You then make a chain of people as you go. 
The little ones are just meant to be collected for bonus points. Gary's also a collectible, so at least we aren't crushing him this time. Unfortunately, it's really easy to run into obstacles, so you'll probably run out of lives before you reach the end. But if that isn't enough, you have to save seven people. If you don't save them all, you still lose. You might as well start over if you miss someone. Honestly, I can't beat the first stage, but in the second one, you use snowmen and piles of snow to build a gigantic snowball to fight Plankton back with. This is really hard, but I like it. Really trains your ability to work through tight spaces. I imagine it's just as hard as it would be if I tried to ski in real life, without the added avalanche. But let's keep up with this trend of really difficult Sarbakan games. Following it up with another super difficult game, here's Plankton's Funhouse. Now this one can be a real pain to figure out. Like with Dutchman's Dash, it resulted in a lot of childhood frustration. As an adult, I didn't struggle with it quite as much, but still, the past cannot be undone. SpongeBob and Patrick need to make their way out of Plankton's evil funhouse. You help them do this by solving puzzles in a bunch of rooms while also fighting enemies and doing everything in a coordinated order. You would either need to hit a switch, find a Krabby Patty, or save Patrick from a tower. She's a princess now. Very happy for her. This game even gave you the option to design your own levels. The stages have some really creative formats and methods you need to utilize to figure them out. Some of them will leave you feeling really stupid when you realize how easy they were this entire time. The later ones are less forgiving and require more super-specific actions, but the game leaves room for some error, which makes it more forgiving than most games in the same genre. I like it, but it is really hard, and I advise you to know what you're getting into before you give it a try. But I still wouldn't say it's as hard as, say, Dutchman's Dash or Krabby Quest or even... Yeah, let's move on. But since this is a spooky game about a spooky haunted funhouse, let's keep up the spooky trend. Here's a Halloween special, Boo or Boom. Many people fondly remember this one. It's a SpongeBob version of Bomberman that happens to have a very strange storyline. Plankton's putting giant jack-o'-lanterns everywhere, and as you know, we just can't have that. So SpongeBob, Patrick, Sandy, and Squidward decide to blow everything up. I mentioned this when I last looked at the game, but I'm pretty sure that damages the city more than it helps it. Great, you saw Plankton's attempt to take over Bikini Bottom by blowing up Bikini Bottom. But hey, I guess it works. He doesn't have anything to take over now. You use bombs that the game refers to as plumsters and try to paint everything in your character's color. You do this while competing with the other characters. Don't get caught in their blasts either. If you do, your progress is erased and you start from square one. It can really shake the direction of the game at any point in time. But this is really easy to get engrossed in. Like with the Bomberman games, it's really addicting. Though I still don't know why the characters don't just let you win if Plankton wins whenever you get a game over. Come on, stand aside, guys. I'm the only one who can save the town around here. From those... jack-o'-lanterns. But this wasn't the only Sarbakan game that came out in October. Another really popular one hit the scene this year, and it was based on a special episode. This was Atlantis Squarepantis Bus Rush. In this, you have to steer the bus to Atlantis before you run out of fuel. You do this in a rather unique way. You're in this map with a view of the bus in the center of the screen. You maneuver it through the maze and collect songs to replenish your musically fueled engine. The red ones take fuel away, so you have to avoid them, but that's really easy to do. You also have obstacles that activate mini-games. Your fuel is slowly draining, so you have to be quick. In this one, you have to break blocks by throwing balls of ice cream at them. In this, you have to rapidly move the mouse back and forth to push the bus out of seaweed. And in this, you click on jellyfish and drag the mouse to throw this swarm away from your bus. But this is pretty cool, and I like being able to see the animations of the bus moving. It's formatted in a very unique way. It isn't too hard either, but not exactly super easy. So it has a good balance, and I understand its popularity. But that's going to do it for Sarbakan, at least for this year. There were three more games released by other companies, so I think we should look at those before we call it quits. Especially because we were met with a very grand entrance this year. This came from a company that, much like Sarbakan, would go on to create numerous hits of their own throughout the 2010s. We're no stranger to them around this channel. This is where we first say hello to Workin' Man. Before they'd go on to make renowned classics like Legends of Bikini Bottom and Nickelodeon Kingdoms, they gave us Flip and Grab. Let's see what this marvelous company had to offer. Wait, wait! <laughs> well, we all have to start somewhere, don't we? Ah, good old Jumpstart, how could you not love it? Hey, hey, stop, stop playing that. 
But nah, the game is fine. Just really to the point. According to the instructions, SpongeBob's gone on a Krabby Patty flipping frenzy. You move Squidward up and down to catch them as he flips them toward you. You click to catch them, but I prefer watching them bounce off of Squidward. Not bad. So now we're nearing the end of the year, so I think it's only appropriate that we go back to one of the first companies in the Spongebob Flash game scene. This is Smashing Ideas. They would show a noticeable increase in quality with the games they'd put out this year. For one, they gave us Reef Rumble, a full-fledged Spongebob fighting game in a style similar to Street Fighter. There's a big tournament in Bikini Bottom and the participants are Spongebob, Patrick, Sandy, and Squidward, as well as Larry and Plankton, who's controlling Robo Crabs. But those two have to be unlocked. You can play arcade mode for a quick match, or tournament mode, which is essentially story mode. You can punch, kick, block, and use a projectile special move. Most of the fighters play similarly, and it's easy to obliterate your opponent with your special move projectile. But the last two fights can be really tough, especially Larry. He's hard to land a hit on. But overall, this is a pretty good fighting game. Some of the special move combinations can be tough to pull off, but it's worth mastering your favorite character for this little tournament. So let's wrap up the year with the other Smashing Ideas game. This one is called Plankton's Pernicious Plot. Oh, have to bust out the pop filter for that title. Plankton invented a hypnopod that makes the jellyfish do his bidding. Now Spongebob has to destroy all the hypnopods and not be destroyed by the jellyfish in the process. Now the art style is very interesting in this one because it doesn't really look like your usual Smashing Ideas game. Look at Spongebob's face when he gets shocked. You jump across platforms and very happily destroy the hypnopods. Look at him smile like that while a massive explosion erupts beneath him. Those are full-blown explosions, too. And they don't leave a scratch on him. Remind me to never get on Spongebob's bad side. Anyway, you avoid the mind-controlled jellyfish, but the cured ones are your friends and give you bonus points. It feels nice to destroy the hypnopods and watch the jellyfish become normal again. It gives you a sense of progress. But what I really like about this game is how high you can jump. I like being able to just jump all the way up to far-off platforms. No rules apply here. So yeah, this one's really enjoyable. This truly has been a very pernicious plot. And that does it for the Smashing Ideas games that came out this year. And as a whole, I think that does it for the games I want to cover in 2007. Now this was a fantastic year for The Sponge, and saw some really interesting creations in it. Some were challenging, some were captivating as all get out, and others were just fascinating to watch unfold. It's really impressive to see Sarbakan's work progress over time. And it's also nice to relive some of the excitement we once experienced. Nick.com was such a great place to visit in the 2000s, and these companies worked to ensure it. I always love being able to look through these older and often forgotten pages of Spongebob history. No matter how obscure they may be, we once experienced them and they did something for us. They contributed to making this year especially nostalgic and that's a great thing. Thank you for joining me, I will see you in the next memory.